Our first speaker will be Mike Tully, President and CEO of Aerial Services Incorporated in Cedar, Cedar Falls, Iowa. Mike will discuss the importance of the fundamentals of aerial mapping. With the availability and ease of using drones, it is easy to forget that the fundamentals are still the same. Mike has been the President and CEO of Aerial Services since 2002. He is a certified photogrammetrist and has a BS in forestry from Northern Arizona University, an MS in forest entomology from the University of Maine, and an MBA from the University of Northern Iowa. He is a certified GIS professional, techno geek, and the head of Getting Right Things Done Well at Aerial Services. Mike is an innovator and thinker. He sees unmanned aerial systems as a disruptive technology to current remote sensing and mapping businesses. Drones will provide thrilling new opportunities for firms that can adapt to new business realities and will be a serious threat to those firms that fail to adapt. So with no further delay, I want to turn the program over to Mike Tully. Well, hi. Thank you for that nice introduction. It is a uh my privilege and sincere pleasure to speak with all of you today. Um, Aerial Services is located in Iowa and has been using manned aircraft and sophisticated sensors for over 50 years to conduct a variety of remote sensing uh, missions all across the nation. Uh, we are indeed uh, entering an exciting time in our profession. Um, <clears throat> The first point I'd like to make uh, today is that we need to establish a business case in this sea of rapidly changing UAS technology and regulatory environment. It's important to recognize that we are in an early period characterized by rapid innovation both technologically and in the regulatory space. So in the midst of this period of very rapid and disruptive change, it's, it's really important that remote sensing and mapping professionals not only have a good business case, but conduct themselves ethically and uh, you know, apply sound business practice. We, we've got to up our game and exude excellence in the things we do. The FAA says that there are around 7,000 aircraft in the uh, air over the US at any given time. But this was before drones. There are already more drones than general aviation aircraft, and these are all flying around in the national airspace. This year alone, we anticipate uh, a million or more drones will be purchased by hobbyists in the US, and even more as the commercial market um, gets going. Non-professional pilots are flying these machines. We've never been here before. Flying sensors are all of a sudden quite capable, inexpensive, and very easy to operate. For the first time in history, literally anyone can now fly sensors in the national airspace. This has huge implications, and safety is a chief and legitimate concern. So if you take nothing out of this presentation, be sure to take this website down, airmap.io. The national airspace is highly regulated because safety of humans flying around in it and on the ground is paramount. This is the most comprehensive site I've found that does a great job to help you see how to fly safely and legally in the national airspace from wherever you happen to be. It's a great planning tool, so it helps you ensure that proper authorities are notified of your UAS flights and you just understand the environment, the regulatory environment that you happen to be operating in today. With technology enabling easy flight, easy aerial photography, easy orthos, easy digital service models, it's awful easy not to notice the fundamentals of mapping. These fundamentals don't change simply because we're using drones. So let's take a minute and look at some of these mapping and remote sensing fundamentals and why they're important. The first thing you notice with a small drone is that many of these are don't weigh very much. 
sometimes next to nothing with carbon fiber wings and things like that. Wind is a formidable opponent. It causes blurring, uh, instability, unpredictable uh, lurching and tipping in the, in the air, and all these can lead to holes in our coverage of photography across the project area. Wind also eats batteries and increases the time needed to acquire an area, which in turn increases our costs. Pitch and roll stability is an important consideration. Many UAVs do not come with any kind of stabilized mount for the camera. So is that necessary for your application? If so, what type of stabilized mount do you need? Um, a two-axis or a three-axis mount? Important considerations. Another uh, key consideration is the type of camera. Is the camera you're using um, a metric camera or a non-metric camera? A metric cam camera is one that has very stable characteristics. They're very repeatable. The, the accuracy of the photography is very repeatable. And they're, they're characterized because the lens distortion has been modeled away. We, we've identified all the imperfections in the lens. Most small drones are non-metric. Altavian, Trimble, and a few others include metric cameras, but by far they're not common yet in these small systems. So what are the costs associated with using non-metric camera? Are, will they have an effect on the quality and accuracy for your application of the drone and mapping products from the drone? This is an example of, a, uh, of an image taken with a GoPro um, camera. And on the bottom right is a, a, is a model showing the, the amount of distortion caused by the camera, very intentional distortion, but distortion nonetheless in both X, Y, and Z. So as you begin to measure the position of objects in the frame, its, its accuracy decreases very rapidly as you go out to the edge of the photo. This is what that same photo looks like once that distortion has been modeled out of the imagery. This is something that uh, can be mapped from. Uh, it can meet level two accuracy standards. So a lot can be done if you are, are aware of the distortion, aware of the uh, type of lens you have, and are knowledgeable about how to map the distortion, model the distortion out. Another important uh, a consideration is the dynamic range of the camera. This is a measure of the um, camera's sensitivity to light. The higher the sensitivity, the better. You can, as that photo on the right shows, um, much more detail is, is apparent in that darkened roof area because that dynamic range of the com camera is better. Uh, exposure settings can certainly affect um, how much you can see in a, on a poorly lit area. But the dynamic range of the camera itself um, restricts just how much um, exposure settings can uh, uh, allow for that um, sensitivity. Of all the factors discussed um, so far, resolving power is uh, the most important because all the others uh, add up and affect resolving power. This is the sum and single most important aspect of mapping from aerial photography. It's a measure of how much detail I can see in a, in a particular image. This is an image taken with a Canon S10 using a SenseFly EB uh, unmanned system. You can see in the blow up there's a couple guys even though this is high resolution imagery, a couple centimeters in size, there's not much detail visible in the faces or in the clothing of those men. This has to do because of the resolving power, the resolving power of this inexpensive non-metric camera being uh, tossed around in the atmosphere is not real high. So that detail, even though the ground resolution is quite high, is not very good. 
Another example here, again, same kind of thing. One of the most common misconceptions is that if my camera can collect high resolution, high GSD imagery, that I'll be able to see amazing detail. But that's not true because it's limited by the resolving power of the camera system, the lens, the aircraft, the entire system. Resolving power can significantly degrade the practical quality and accuracy of any high resolution image. Time is also a considerable um, factor that we need to consider in planning for our missions. Uh, it, it can take considerable time to uh, acquire a square mile of uh, area. We call these small UAVs for a reason. They're very tall, tiny and slow. Their camera footprints are very small uh, from 400 feet above the ground. So it takes time, a lot of time, to cover much ground. Do you know how long it's going to take to cover your project area? What if you can't fly and you spend an hour driving to the site? So time and space is an important consideration. To illustrate this point, let's just look at um, what uh, practic practically what can be accomplished using a small drone. This is what can be acquired in about a, a half day using a small drone, about a square mile. That's a picture of O'Hare Airport. The runways are about a mile or so in length. That's about the area that can be collected on a good day at 400 feet with a drone, one square mile. If I put a camera in my manned aircraft in that same period, I can acquire 250 square miles. So it's a great tool for the right kind of job, and it's a terrible tool if it's not aligned with the uh, needs of the project you have in mind. Another important uh, consideration, especially since safety is paramount and uh, you know good business is important, is training. Are your pilots and observers trained? Uh, do they have sufficient preparation to be effective out in the field? Have, uh, do they understand how to deal with the drone or a spare drone, spare cameras, spare cables, computers, etc.? Do they understand the weather and are they effectively trained in how to contingency plan for the weather, which is typically, uh, characteristically, very unpredictable? A uh, power is another very important consideration. <clears throat> um, in a small drone, a typical small drone today, you might be able to get a, a collect a hundred acres per battery. They can fly 30 minutes tops less on a windy day. Wind is a formidable opponent, as we said. Recharging in the field is very slow, so it typically means you've got to come prepared with a half dozen fully charged batteries to boot. So maybe your project needs to have a gas engine drone. Battery is not going to cut it, but understand what those limitations are and act accordingly. Uh, many new drone users know nothing about ground control. This and positional accuracy are a couple concepts that can be ignored only at your own peril. You cannot objectively test the accuracy of your orthos, your digital surface models, or mapping with less than 20 ground control points. The number and position of points throughout your area of interest is also important. You must understand these principles to make a quality map. Um, acquisition parameters are another, you know, it, it, it almost um, seems self-evident, but people often don't think about all of these things. Um, but things like, does my system have an integrated GPS and IMU? Most of these today have a GPS. Most do not have an IMU, an inertial measurement sensor, uh, which enables even more positional accuracy and faster data processing. Do you need both? Can you meet the accuracy specifications using just a GPS? Uh, important questions. Uh, again, swath width, you know, how much ground does one frame cover from whatever altitude you're going to fly at? How much side lap and end lap is 
end lap is needed, um, are you going to need stereo imagery? Those kinds of questions are important and must be understood before you fly. Uh, what, what kind of imagery do you need? Do you need color? Do you need infrared? Do you need red edge? Do you need a one band image or perhaps a four band image? And what's possible with your unmanned system? Uh, LIDAR is, uh, is an important uh, sensor type. Um, do you need it? Um, there's not many available yet, but they are, uh, there are a number of models pictured here that are available and, and designed for these small unmanned systems. Flash LIDAR is coming and will change the world of LIDAR on small drones as it matures and becomes and comes to the market. We see the first systems available now for manned aircraft and they will quickly make their way um, as much smaller, lighter components to unmanned systems over the next two or three years and they will uh, revolutionize uh, LIDAR and point clouds from drones. Uh, the kind of outputs you need are, are, are also important um, to understand. There are a number of mapping products that are made from these drone sensors and understanding their concepts and best practices for their use is imperative. Uh, too many new remote sensing professionals, um, these may be poorly understood. You know, what is semi-global matching? Do you know what a digital surface model is and how that differs from a digital elevation model? Do your DTMs need brake lines or not to meet the accuracy specifications of your project? There are a number of uh, um, providers of uh, uh, point cloud processing and uh, digital surface model uh, applications uh, pictured here. All of those are, I've tested, I think, all of those and they're all do a great job and are excellent tools but have their uh, pros and cons and strengths and weaknesses and uh, may be applicable to your project or not. Orthophotography is another um, common uh, product from um, unmanned systems. That's a, this, there's a number of steps that uh, one must go through to create an ortho photo and it's important to understand um, what those are and what they mean. Today a lot of the UAS software packages bundled with aircraft have you know an easy button. You just push this button and out come orthos after hours of processing. So, but it's important to understand that not all packages are created equal. Some are using computer vision algorithms, um, and these, you'll, you'll find these commonly on uh, inexpensive camera systems with UAS. Generally, accuracy is sacrificed for speed and ease of use in these different packages. Like in so many things, there is a tension between uh, speed and ease of use and accuracy and, and one must understand those trade-offs because in the end nothing is free, right? It might be easy to use but you're sacrificing quality and accuracy oftentimes. So important uh, uh, software attributes you want to look for when you're thinking of a system is do they provide any kind of self-calibration? Uh, what kinds of QAQC reports can you get out about the data from your uh, drone? And then can any of the sources of error be weighted? Um, many factors contribute to the overall error and positional accuracy of these products. And sometimes it's very advantageous to weight error differently depending upon its source. There are a number of great packages um, bundled or not with uh, drones today and they all do a great job and again some have a, a different collection of features and advantages so uh, it's good to uh, do some due diligence on these different packages and, and know what you need to meet the intended use of your uh, remotely sensed information. 
I want to talk just about a minute about quality control and accuracy. Um, the first thing I could I could say about this is know the intended use. Get a system and components for the system that um, are designed to meet or exceed the intended use of your data. You can't get a drone that'll do everything well. So f know what your intended use is of your use and the stakeholders of the project and match the features appropriately. Your selection of processing software will affect the quality and accuracy of all these products. Whether your inputs or outputs, um, quality control and accuracy should be front and center in your operations. This is what will separate the good from the bad. Uh, quality control and accuracy are, are difficult to achieve and require deliberate attention throughout all phases of acquisition and production of remote sensing projects. Remember, it's not just the acquisition of the data that affects accuracy, but it's also the processing of that data can, can make or break accuracy in the products being created. And uh, a um, accurate ortho or point cloud looks identical to an inaccurate ortho or point cloud. It is not hard to pass off inaccurate data for something that looks good. Many of the things listed above conspire to steal accuracy from geospatial uh, products. Do you know how accurate your data is? What level of accuracy is expected? And then finally, how do you objectively test the accuracy of your remote sensing? This slide here is, is sufficient to just show that there are accuracy standards. ASPRS, the American Society for Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing, uh, uh, publishes these positional accuracy standards for all of these mapping products, orthophotography, digital surface models, digital elevation models, and uh, uh, mapping. So they exist know what they are, know how to use them. And these standards are great because they also explain how to use them and how to test accuracy for the products that you will be creating uh, with your uh, drones. So in summary, I'd just like to uh, reiterate that drones are, are great new tools. Um, amazing remote sensing that has not been possible before will be done because of drones and these small, smart flying sensors. And uh, we'll uh, be able to create wonderful mapping uh, material um, using careful planning, well-trained professionals, and by heeding the fundamentals of sound, remote sensing, and mapping. These tools are going to be uh, provide all of these new opportunities, they're also going to be very disruptive. And uh, it's important for us to understand uh, the business side. Can we make money at the end of the day uh, sending two people um, in a pickup truck to collect these uh, areas with drones? Um, do you understand the tool? Um, and um, are they the right tool? for the right application and for the intended use. Understanding accuracy is uh, fundamental to all of this. Thank you very much. Uh, you're welcome to visit our website. We've got a, a great drone book there that uh, has a, a lot of good information about drones and about the regulatory environment and what I think is what they're going to look like and how they're going to affect our economy and remote sensing and mapping in, in specifically. So thank you very much. I appreciate this opportunity and happy to take questions in the end.